Hello, and welcome back. We're on week nine of the 50 book challenge, and today we'll be discussing Breath by James Nestor. As inferred by the title, this book explores various breathing exercises that have been developed and practiced throughout history. However, it also explores other factors that may be less obvious to our breathing, such as diet, climate, and our facial shape. This beautifully written book takes you on a journey alongside Nestor to uncover the secrets behind breathing, aiming to discover how we can use our breath to influence our mind, body, and even take advantage of parts of our brain that were previously assumed to be subconscious. Let's jump right into the review. Nestor starts the book off by introducing the idea that humans are the worst breathers on the planet. Looking at ancient skulls, we can see that the mouths used to be twice as wide as they are today. They had expansive sinus cavities and broad mouths, and bizarrely, even though none of the ancient people ever flossed or brushed or saw a dentist, they all had straight teeth. The shape of our jaws has changed, taking on a more narrow V shape instead of the previous U-shaped jaw that was significantly wider. As a result of this narrowing of the jaw, our teeth no longer have enough space to properly grow in, resulting in various issues for humans. These people likely never snored or had sleep apnea or sinusitis or many other chronic respiratory problems that affect modern populations. They did not because they could not. Their skulls were far too large and their airways too wide for anything to block them. They breathed easy. Snoring is rarely seen as a problem and is instead viewed as something that we just do. Snoring is not natural, however. As Nestor emphasizes, contrary to what most of us might think, no amount of snoring is normal, and no amount of sleep apnea comes without risks of serious health effects. Our body is literally choking on itself, desperately trying to get air into our lungs. It's a problem we evolved to acquire, not something we were naturally intended to experience. The broader mouths and expansive sinus cavities allowed for easier breathing, a privilege that us humans no longer have access to. Of the 5,400 different species of mammals on the planet, humans are now the only ones to routinely have misaligned jaws, overbites, underbites, and snaggled teeth, a condition formerly called malocclusion. It is obvious then that there must be something causing this sudden change, something only humans are doing that leads us to suffer from these misaligned jaws and snaggled teeth. Nestor acknowledged the question, why would we evolve to make ourselves sick? This introduces a concept called disevolution. 1.7 million years ago, the first human ancestor, Homo habilis, was roaming around. This human ancestor had developed opposable thumbs, enabling them to pull plants and roots from the ground, as well as resulting in the creation of tools which would be used to hunt and carve flesh from bone. Eating such a diet was time consuming and took a lot of effort. As a result, we began tenderizing food with the use of stones, saving us some energy from the process of chewing and digestion. This extra energy was used by our bodies to develop our brains, causing them to grow physically larger. As humans began to process food in fire, food became increasingly easier to prepare and digest, but simultaneously led us to take on a soft and processed diet. This diet would further result in a considerable increase in brain size due to an enormous amount of calories being consumed. However, the brain needed space to grow into. It began using up space from the front of our face, consisting of our sinuses, mouths, and airways. This left us with a uniquely human feature, the protruding nose. The problem was that this smaller, vertically positioned nose was less efficient at filtering air, and it exposed us to more airborne pathogens and bacteria. The smaller sinuses and mouth also reduced space in our throats. The more we cooked, the more soft, calorie-rich food we consumed, the larger our brains grew, and the tighter our airways became. This ultimately fueled the evolution from Homo habilis to Homo sapiens, us. Homo sapiens began to undergo further evolution that influenced even more changes to our face shape. In colder climates, our noses would grow narrower and longer to more efficiently heat up air before it entered our lungs. Our skin would grow lighter to take in more sunshine for production of vitamin D. In sunny and warm environments, we adapted wider and flatter noses, which were more efficient at inhaling hot and humid air. Our skin would grow darker to protect us from the sun. Along the way, the larynx would descend in the throat to accommodate another adaptation, vocal communication. Although the descent of the larynx enabled vocal communication, it became less efficient at its original purpose, preventing choking. 
sapiens would become the only animals and the only human species that could easily choke on food and die. These same adaptations that allowed for humans to take over the world would eventually come back to haunt us by causing us to choke on our own bodies. Snoring. Nestor goes on to discuss the impacts of breathing on athletic performance and explores the detrimental impacts of mouth breathing. To understand how breathing affects athletic performance, we first need to understand how the body makes energy from air and food. There are two options, with oxygen, a process known as aerobic respiration, and without it, which is called anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic energy is generated only with glucose, a simple sugar, and it's quicker and easier for our bodies to access. It's a kind of backup system and turbo boost when the body doesn't have enough oxygen, but anaerobic energy is inefficient and can be toxic creating an excess of lactic acid. The nausea, muscle weakness, and sweating you experience after you've pushed it too hard at the gym is the feeling of anaerobic overload. This process explains why the first few minutes of an intense workout are often so miserable. Our lungs and respiratory system haven't caught up to supply the oxygen our bodies need, and so the body has to use anaerobic respiration. This also explains why, after we've warmed up, exercise feels easier. The body has switched from anaerobic to aerobic respiration. I found this pretty interesting. I've always observed that exercise feels pretty horrible at the start, but after a few minutes I actually begin to perform better, even though I've used up some of my energy. As anaerobic respiration is intended as a backup system for the body, our body has fewer anaerobic muscle fibers. If we rely on these less developed muscles too often, they eventually break down. More injuries occur during the post-New Year's rush to gyms than at any other time of the year, because too many people attempt to exercise far over their thresholds. This is another interesting point. New Year's resolutions to exercise are always fueled by motivation, meaning that people suddenly have a desire to push themselves to levels that far exceed anything they've ever demonstrated in the past. Not only does this lead to burnout and exhaustion, it also leads to injury, as the body is not ready for this sudden change. Something I found interesting while reading was the idea that age directly correlates to your body's maximum aerobic heart limit. Finding the best heart rate for exercise is easy, Subtract your age from 180. The result is the maximum your body can withstand to stay in the aerobic state. Long bouts of training and exercise can happen below this rate, but never above it. Otherwise, the body will risk going too deep into the anaerobic zone for too long. Instead of feeling invigorated and strong after a workout, you'd feel tired, shaky, and nauseated. While I assume this is simply a rough guideline rather than an entirely accurate measurement, it makes me wonder whether the body is continuously declining in aerobic capability, or if we can manipulate this number. I would imagine you can surely train to increase this heart rate limit, but maybe it's just something to think about. Nestor next moves on to discuss the nasal cycle, which is the phenomenon where nostrils close and open throughout the day and night. Researchers confirmed that the right and left nasal cavities controlled temperature and blood pressure, and fed the brain chemicals to alter our moods, emotions, and sleep states. The right nostril is a gas pedal. When you're inhaling primarily through this channel, circulation speeds up, your body gets hotter, and cortisol levels, blood pressure, and heart rate all increase. This happens because breathing through the right side of the nose activates the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight mechanism that puts the body in a more elevated state of alertness and readiness. Breathing through the right nostril will also feed more blood to the opposite hemisphere of the brain specifically to the prefrontal cortex, which has been associated with logical decisions, language, and computing. Inhaling through the left nostril has the opposite effect. It works as a kind of brake system to the right nostril's accelerator. The left nostril is more deeply connected to the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and relax side that lowers temperature and blood pressure, cools the body, and reduces anxiety. Left nostril breathing shifts blood flow to the opposite side of the prefrontal cortex, the right area that plays a role in creative thought, emotions, formation of mental abstractions, and negative emotions. There's a yoga practice that takes advantage of this by manipulating the body's functions with forced breathing through the nostrils. I tried to observe this in my own life after reading the book. I noticed that when I was in bed ready to fall asleep, I was breathing through my left nostril predominantly. Whereas, when I was doing an activity like reading, only my right nostril was available to take in air. This could have been a coincidence, or maybe there's another explanation for this. I'm unsure if the nostrils directly correlate to the mental state you're in, as I wonder how this explains when you can breathe through both nostrils at the same time. Nonetheless, it's an interesting idea that's worth keeping in mind. A fascinating note that Nestor provided was that mouth breathing causes the body to lose 40% more water. 
During a mouth breathing experiment he conducted, he found that this oddly increased the need to urinate. This was partly because of the sleep apnea that comes alongside mouth breathing. During the deepest, most restful stages of sleep, the pituitary gland, a pea-sized ball at the base of the brain, secretes hormones that control the release of adrenaline, endorphins, growth hormone, and other substances, including vasopressin, which communicates with cells to store more water. This is how animals can sleep through the night without feeling thirsty or needing to relieve themselves. But if the body has an adequate time in deep sleep, as it does when it experiences chronic sleep apnea, vasopressin won't be secreted normally. The kidneys will release water, which triggers the need to urinate and signals to our brains that we should consume more liquid. We get thirsty and we need to pee more. A lack of vasopressin explains not only my own irritable bladder, but the constant, seemingly unquenchable thirst I have every night. The night after the mouth breathing experiment ended and Nestor was able to use his nose to breathe once again, he said, I never woke up needing to pee. I didn't have to because my pituitary gland was likely releasing vasopressin. I was finally sleeping soundly. Naturally, your nasal passages humidify the air that you breathe in. This typically doesn't occur during mouth breathing. The consequence is that you lose a significant amount of water from your body when you mouth breathe. At night, this might promote an increased need to drink. This, coupled with the fact that sleep apnea limits the ability to fall into a deep sleep, can reduce the production of vasopressin in your body, resulting in the need to go to the toilet during the night, further reducing the amount of sleep achieved, and creating a vicious cycle. At this point, Nestor introduces an idea that becomes the fundamental theme of the book. This is the idea that carbon dioxide is beneficial to the human body, and that human beings are breathing too quickly. In regards to respiration, oxygen is the cellular fuel, and hemoglobin is the transporter, when oxygen went into a cell, carbon dioxide came out. A Danish physiologist named Christian Bohr conducted experiments to find out why some cells got oxygen more easily than others, and how breathing really worked. He found that blood with the most carbon dioxide in it, more acidic, loosened oxygen from hemoglobin. In some ways, carbon dioxide worked as a kind of divorce lawyer, a go-between to separate oxygen from its ties, so it could be free to land another mate. This discovery explained why certain muscles used during exercise received more oxygen than lesser used muscles. They were producing more carbon dioxide, which attracted more oxygen. It was supply on demand, at a molecular level. Carbon dioxide also had a profound dilating effect on blood vessels, opening these pathways so they could carry more oxygen-rich blood to hungry cells. Breathing less allowed animals to produce more energy more efficiently. This discovery invites an incredible insight into the way we can manipulate our breathing to take control of our respiration. Carbon dioxide is typically framed as something bad that we need to eliminate from our system, seeking to maximize the oxygen that we have inside our bodies. The natural idea is that carbon dioxide is a waste product, so it must be good to remove it, right? Not necessarily. Heavy breathing purges the carbon dioxide in our system. This could result in reduced blood flow to muscles, tissues, and organs. For a healthy body, overbreathing or inhaling pure oxygen would have no benefit, no effect on oxygen delivery to our tissues and organs, and could actually create a state of oxygen deficiency, leading to relative suffocation. It's made obvious by this point that carbon dioxide is necessary in order for our bodies to function properly, and the overbreathing that is found among the population might be detrimental to our long term health and well being. An American physiologist named Yandel Henderson noted that carbon dioxide is the chief hormone of the entire body. It is the only one that is produced by every tissue and that probably acts on every organ. Carbon dioxide is, in fact, a more fundamental component of living matter than is oxygen. Although we previously discussed how the growth of the brain as a result of food processing ended up compromising the space at the front of our face, this was not solely responsible for the change in our face shapes. There was another, much more important element at play, chewing. 12,000 years ago, humans in Southwest Asia and the Fertile Crescent in the Eastern Mediterranean stopped gathering wild roots and vegetables and hunting game, as they had for hundreds of thousands of years. They started growing their food. These were the first farming cultures, and in these primitive communities, humans suffered from the first widespread instances of crooked teeth and deformed mouths. Although, it wasn't terrible at first, and not all cultures suffered from this. It seemed entirely random. Then, about 300 years ago, these maladies went viral. Suddenly, all at once, much of the world's population began to suffer. Their mouths shrank, faces grew flatter, and sinuses plugged. This was the first time in human history that humans could live off of nothing but processed food. 
they grew all their food, cooked all their food, and it continued to become more and more refined. Wheat turned into flour, the German bran from rice was ripped away, leaving only the starchy white seed. Canned fruits, vegetables, and meat increased the shelf life of the food, allowing it to be distributed to the general public. However, this provided two significant downsides. Firstly, processed diets contain less vitamins and minerals. In fact, when referring to Weston Price's research on diets of indigenous communities who were still eating traditional foods, Nestor writes, while the foods in these diets varied, they all contained the same high amounts of vitamins and minerals, from one and a half to 50 times that of modern diets, all of them. Price became convinced that the cause of our shrinking mouths and obstructed airways was deficiencies not of just D or C, but all essential vitamins. Vitamins and minerals, he discovered, work in symbiosis. One needs the other to be effective. This explained why supplements could be useless unless they're in the presence of other supplements. We needed all these nutrients to develop strong bones throughout the body, especially in the mouth and face. We had clearly removed the minerals and vitamins that we needed from our diets, resulting in an inability to develop strong bones in our faces. This refined diet allowed for widespread distribution of food, but it also enabled widespread distribution of disease. And while the research was correct, it was only half the story. We suffered from a distinct lack of chewing. Healthy foods in the modern day, for example, avocado, chicken breast, smoothies, oatmeal, or vegetable soups, all share one characteristic they're all soft. Our ancestors used to spend hours a day, every day, chewing their food. This caused them to develop strong and wide jaws and faces. The food in our society is so processed that it hardly requires chewing at all. Just thinking about my experience, I realize that this is very true in my life. Arguably, the only thing I eat that requires some chewing is chicken wings, but that's only because it's meat on a bone. The meat itself is still soft. Pretty much everything else I eat is soft food barely requiring any effort to chew at all. Nestor mentioned how the changes in our mouth also contributed to changes in our posture. Many of us adopted this S posture, not because of a laziness, but because our tongues don't fit properly in our two small mouths. Having nowhere else to go, the tongue falls back into the throat, creating a mild suffocation. At night, we choke and cough, attempting to push air in and out of this obstructed airway. This, of course, is sleep apnea, and a quarter of Americans suffer from it. By day, we unconsciously attempt to open up our obstructed airways by sloping our shoulders, craning our necks forward, and tilting our heads up. Think of someone who is unconscious and about to receive CPR, Mike said. The first thing a medic does is tilt the head back to open the throat. We've adopted the CPR posture all the time. This is an interesting, but also quite sad point to think about. Many people struggle with posture nowadays, myself included, and hearing that there may be a subconscious factor at play that contributes to this makes it feel like changing it is a bit of an uphill battle. However, Nestor does mention how the maxilla, the bone that makes up the center of the face, is highly plastic in comparison to other bones in our body, suggesting it can remodel and grow more dense into our 70s and even further beyond. All we need are stem cells, and the way we produce and signal stem cells to build more maxilla bone in the face is by engaging the masseter, by clamping down on the back molars over and over. Chewing. The more we gnaw, the more stem cells release, the more bone density and growth will trigger, the younger we'll look, and the better we'll breathe. In the appendix, Nestor suggests gum chewing as a way to strengthen the jaw and stimulate stem cell growth. He specifically recommends phallium and mastic gum which are harder to chew, offering a more vigorous jaw workout. Shifting to an explanation about electron excitability proposed by St. Giorgi, Nestor writes, What distinguishes inanimate objects like rocks from birds and bees and leaves is the level of energy or the excitability of electrons within those atoms that make up the molecules in matter. The more easily and often electrons can be transferred between molecules, the more desaturated matter becomes, the more alive it is. Oxygen is a strong electron acceptor. The more oxygen life can consume, the more electron excitability it gains, the more animated it becomes. This suggests that a breakdown of electron excitability is what causes metal to rust and leaves to turn brown and die. St. Georgi wrote about how humans rust as well. As the cells in our body lose the ability to attract oxygen, electrons within them will slow and stop freely interchanging with other cells, resulting in unregulated and abnormal growth. Tissues will begin rusting in much the same way as other materials, but we don't call this tissue rust, we call it cancer. 
and this helps explain why cancers develop and thrive in environments of low oxygen. Therefore, the proposed solution to keeping tissues in the body healthy is to flood our bodies with a constant presence of oxygen. Making reference to the idea proposed earlier about respiration, Nestor notes how breathing slow, less, and through the nose balances the levels of respiratory gases in the body and sends the maximum amount of oxygen to the maximum amount of tissues so that our cells have the maximum amount of electron reactivity. As we discussed earlier, a slower rate of breathing increases the level of carbon dioxide within the body, which subsequently increases the amount of oxygen that's being exchanged within our body. This ultimately suggests that slow nose breathing can optimize the electron reactivity within our body, reducing our risk of tissue rust, or in other words, cancer. To conclude the book, Nestor finally arrives at one conclusion. The perfect breath is this. Breathe in for about 5.5 seconds, then exhale for 5.5 seconds. That's 5.5 breaths a minute for a total of about 5.5 liters of air. You can practice this perfect breathing for a few minutes or a few hours. There's no such thing as having too much peak efficiency in your body. In regards to my thoughts, just from an anecdotal experience, during the week that I was reading this book, I had an experience in class that made me think about it a lot. I was sitting in a seminar where we were discussing topics from the lecture the day before, and there was this guy sitting next to me who was breathing really heavily and really quickly. I paid attention to how quickly he was breathing and realized that roughly every time I took a breath, he was taking four breaths, and all of them were really loud and heavy. He was also tapping his foot on the floor really quickly and overall just seemed very anxious. And when the teacher spoke to him, he gave short, snappy remarks in response. Of course, I don't mention this to disrespect him, it's just that it was evident that he was anxious or stressed just through his breathing alone. It shows that when we're in these situations, our breathing can magnify the problem. If you're conscious of your breathing and catch yourself breathing heavily and quickly when you're anxious, you can essentially breathe yourself back into relaxation. It also just communicates a sense of calmness and relaxation. I imagine you'd rather be seen as confident and relaxed than anxious and constantly on edge. Something I noticed while reading the book is James Nestor's wonderfully creative mind. I'm reading a book about breathing, but at times it feels like I'm reading beautiful poetry. For example, there are wispy plumes of cirrus clouds moving across the night sky, as big as spaceships. Above them, a few stubborn stars punch through the mist and cluster around the waxing moon. I love the way he manages to create such vivid imagery. There were times during my read in which I forgot that this was supposed to be a science book, in the sense that it was easy to read and very engaging. For those who may struggle to read non-fiction science-based books, this book is a good place to start exploring that interest, as it provides a nice middle ground between mentally challenging topics and an enjoyable read simply for recreation. Nestor went into detail about the tremendous efforts of Carl Stowe, a choir conductor who managed to help people who were suffering from conditions such as emphysema to undergo an almost total recovery, despite being told that the condition was incurable. He mentioned how Stowe has an autobiography named Dr. Breath. I found this part of the book really interesting, and so I've added this autobiography onto my reading list to find out more. I've been wanting to read more autobiographies recently, as the only one I've read in a while was by David Goggins, which was also an incredible read. Last year, I read a book by Wim Hof about breathing, quite fittingly called The Wim Hof Method. Hof is widely known when it comes to the ideas of meditation and breathing exercises. My friend recommended one of his guided meditation YouTube videos to me and said it brought him great results, and the feedback on the video seemed incredible, with hundreds of thousands of likes. The thing is that in that book, Wim Hof speaks about increasing the alkalinity of your body by inhaling more oxygen and exhaling more carbon dioxide. He talks about how it reduces inflammation and can help heal people who struggle with various health problems. In James Nestor's book, however, he suggests the opposite, mentioning that breathing too much and ridding your body of too much carbon dioxide can be harmful. While he also mentions how it increases the alkalinity of your body, he claims that this requires your kidneys to undergo a process known as buffering, in which an alkaline compound called bicarbonate is released into the urine to reduce the alkalinity of your body back to its baseline of 7.4 on the pH scale. He mentions how although this is a temporary solution, the constant buffering of your kidney can cause health complications, as your body rids itself of magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, and other essential minerals alongside the bicarbonate that it releases into your urine. I began writing this book review before I finished the entire book, and at the time I'd made a note that went as follows. It seems as though these two writers conflict with one another. I'm more likely to follow the words of James Nestor as he's a science journalist, whereas Wim Hof is a motivational speaker who may have more unconventional ideas. 
but Wim Hof seems to have achieved such tremendous feats, and his methods have received such incredible feedback that it's a confusing decision. It either suggests that both methods are viable, or maybe that neither of them matter that much. However, after finishing the book, I realized that James Nestor actually addresses Wim Hof in the book, as well as various other people who have become famous for their breath work. He acknowledges that there are both methods of breathing quickly and lightly, as well as methods of breathing slowly and deeply. As a reader, it was slightly confusing, as taking this advice on which one to follow seems particularly challenging. If both of them work for opposite reasons, does it matter which one's followed? It seemed like the overarching premise of James Nestor's book was that a greater amount of carbon dioxide within the body is beneficial, explaining why the slow breathing was useful. However, it was ultimately unclear to me how Wim Hof's method worked if the intention was to increase the levels of oxygen within the human body. Upon further consideration, it could be that a higher level of carbon dioxide in the body increases the amount of oxygen our body parts receive, meaning that both breathing exercises provide a similar function in different ways. James Nestor notes how, Overbreathing has gotten a bad rap in the past few decades, and rightfully so. Feeding the body more air than it needs is damaging for the lungs, right down to the cellular level. Today the majority of us breathe more than we should, without realizing it. Willing yourself to breathe heavily for a short intense time, however, can be profoundly therapeutic. It's only through disruption that we can be normal again, McGee told me. This suggests that he believes slower and more gentle breathing is optimal for operating in a day-to-day -day state, but that heavy and fast breathing can be beneficial when practiced for a short period of time. Thanks for watching my book review of Breath by James Nestor. Next week, we'll be reviewing Feel Good Productivity by Ali Abdal, a well-known productivity YouTuber and ex-doctor. This book takes on a new approach to productivity, placing importance on the sustainability and good feelings that come with it, rather than simply powering through. If you've previously had struggles with your own consistency or have a bad habit of procrastination, this is the book for you. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the review. See you next week.